out here in the story on this historic morning course Would you find someone nearby that had a chance to say, Filippo de Dinos, who? Oh, I couldn't have said that. Dinos! Good morning and welcome Cornerstone family. We're so happy that you're here with us today. We have, we're having a special, very special service today because today is our United Bilingual Baptism Installation and Picnic Service. <laughs> and talking about bilingual, let me try to translate all that in Spanish. <laughs> Muy buenos días, familia de Cornerstone, sean bienvenidos a nuestro servicio de hoy. Hoy tenemos un servicio especial, va a ser nuestro servicio unido, bilingüe, de bautismo, de instalación y de picnic en el día de hoy. Así que, gloria al Señor por eso. I'm so happy that we're celebrating today because uh, in just a few moments we're going to be celebrating uh, something special as well. But before we go there, uh, just a couple of announcements. First, we're having baptism and we want you guys to be able to express your thoughts and, and blessings to the, to the participants. Uh, in the Welcome Center, you'll find some cards that you can sign to, the, to those who are getting baptized today. As well, if, um, if you know someone that needs a translation devices, they're up there as well. If you lost something already, uh, please contact Christina. She has a couple of stuff already in her, locked in her office, so talk to her. Um, now, in just a few moments, we're going to have uh, be celebrating the, co the ordinance of baptism, in which uh, two of our Cornerstone families will be baptizing their, their daughters. And uh, they have uh, played their, uh, place their faith in Christ alone for their salvation. And the water that they're going to be baptized in today, and they're going to they're, they're gonna be entering in just a few moments, it's a special water. It doesn't have the power to cleanse, to clean their sins or transform their lives, but it is because they have already placed uh, their faith and have come to Christ in repentance and faith that their sins have been forgiven. And this is a symbolism. It's just a an outward expression of our inward reality, and we're going to be celebrating that today. So uh, uh, without further ado, let me call Pastor Daniel uh, up from here. It, it's my joy to get to uh, baptize our eldest daughter, Aubrey. Aubrey, before you get in, I got a couple of questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a teacher. He gets, she gets questions. So, Aubrey, in the Gospel of John, John tells us that I write these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the, set, the promised Messiah. Aubrey, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the promised Messiah? Aubrey, we also are told in Scripture that there's no way for us to be restored in relationship to God because of our sins except believing that Jesus died for our sins. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? All right. And Aubrey, as a result of that, do you believe that you have been buried with Christ and raised to new life because of your faith? Awesome. Well, it's my joy to baptize you this morning. to welcome up a dear brother in Christ and deacon of Iglesia de Vica Cornerstone, Jonathan Castillo, who's going to baptize his daughter. So Jonathan, have you. Um, I've really grown in this church, and um, it's 
especially in the Spanish speaking church. En realidad he crecido mucho en esta iglesia, específicamente en la iglesia que habla español. And even though I don't really speak complete fluent Spanish, they've always been <laughs> very um, sweet to me and um, they kind of know me now. So. <laughs> Aunque no hablo español perfectamente, gracias por favor para mí siempre que estoy con ustedes. Es para mí un placer estar ahí con ustedes. And um, I'm, they've always, um, even though people sometimes don't have a lot of money or don't have um, everything in this world, that they give what they can. And um, that's a wonderful example. So they're like um, the widow in the Bible who um, gives with love. Y han sido un ejemplo muy grande para mí. Puedo ver que en sus vidas, a pesar de las dificultades que tenemos en la vida, el amor de ustedes ha sido un gran ejemplo para mí. Este, Abby, ahora que, es, que tú estás aquí presente, tú estás eh, confesando que has venido al Señor en arrepentimiento y fe. Y también que Él es, ha puesto tu fe en Él para tu salvación eterna. Entonces, y también estás prometiendo seguirle y buscándole a él todos los días de tu vida. start a worship service together this morning you know this year has been um what's well, been really neat to see god's faithfulness to us as individuals to us as a church we certainly have gone through a, a big transition and uh, i'm personally grateful for the search team that has done an amazing and amazing amount of work behind the scenes we're going to honor those guys this morning i'm personally again very grateful for michael hannah who's the chair of our search team uh, this guy put in more time and hours than everything else than I even want to think about but he's going to uh, invite the search team to come up with thank you so much Michael well good morning. good morning all right well if I can have the search team I think you know who you are we should know who you are uh, so come on up right here join me up here I did warn them in advance but uh is Annie Cody Brian Martin, Sharon Johnson, Robert Sims, Jonathan Castillo, and Jeff Polly. Great. Well, I'm going to spend a few minutes. Is that everybody? Or Mr. Robert. Yeah, Robert. <laughs> Robert's in the shade. Well, I'm going to spend a few minutes, and I'm, I figured I'll, I'll ask you guys to just wait up here a little bit while I share a little bit of uh, just the testimony of all the amazing things that God has done. Um, so I'm Michael Hanna. I was the search chair and the elder here at Cornerstone, and I had the privilege of serving as uh, the search chair over the last year or so. Um, and it was just an amazing, uh, amazing time to go through that process, not knowing, but then God fulfilling, and God is faithful. So I want to share a little bit. Not all of you who were around for the whole journey here, or some of you were a part of the journey, but from a different perspective. And uh, so I just want to share, you know, back in November, this, so our Pastor Brent, who's here, join us, and he'll, he'll be speaking to us in a little bit. But November 7th of 2021, he made the announcement, and he, he shared with us that God is calling him to, uh, to serve with the district, with the EFCA district. And that he and LD were, were praying for it, they felt called, and they were going to follow God's lead. And then and on the December the 6th of 2021 was our very first, as a search team, we formed the search team, their very first meeting is in the Welcome Center. You guys know the Welcome Center? Well, it's, it's no longer there. <laughs> it's amazing how things have changed. Um, and now it's, it's an amazing area where we, we really have shared community there already. But we met there for our very first meeting. Brent spoke to us, shared a couple of things, and uh, we prayed together. And we, we, we partnered with Ed L. Moore um, as a search firm. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. And you know, we went through the process, we had a site visit, and many of you were invited to, to participate in that, share your perspectives, share, share the things that you're hoping for, um, ultimately. And, and then we kind of got a, a feel of what, what this church is looking for, what this church needs, and ultimately trying to follow God's lead. And then 
Fast forward, so that was December 6th of 2021. Fast forward to December 18th and after, so of 2022, so it's past December, so almost, so a year. And that's when we had the final vote for Daniel. And all through that time, God was working to find, to find you know, what God knew where Daniel was, um, but just to bring us together, our church body and Daniel and, and Lauren. And um, it's just amazing all the, the times. And then the search team had so many conversations, so many, um, you know, we met with many amazing candidates, um, but we really felt, and God really brought us unity through his spirit, just in all the conversations. We didn't always agree about everything, but, but God is faithful and he brought us together. And, and so what I'm gonna say, I wanna, so that's a little bit of a recap at a high level, but I wanna share a, a couple of things. First, I just wanna share some words of thanks. You know, first and foremost to God, you know, you know, we use this this term, the search, the search team. I don't know if you've ever struggled with that, but the, the term, the search team. You know, God in His sovereignty. You know, if you zoom out, God knows. He knows where Keeper Cornerstone was. He knew where Daniel and Lauren were. I don't I actually know where Lauren is now, but <laughs> okay, but but God knows where Lauren is right now. But God knew in His sovereignty. He knew where we were. So you know, us searching is really a, it's an illusion. Like we don't know what's coming, but God knows in His sovereignty, and He brought us together. Uh, but I want to read Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a single penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. Two sparrows, one penny, but yet God cares for them. And then us, all these people under the tent, you know, his, his body is believers. God cares. And he, he's sovereign and he knew. He was going to take care of us. And so us as a search team, yes, it was a, it's, a, it's a difficult task, a big, a big job. But really, you know, we just trust God. And God took care of us. And so I just want to thank, um, for, and I want to say another word of thanks, Brent and Elby. Just thanks for, for answering God's call, even though it's different than maybe you were expecting. But thank you for answering God's call. And for Daniel and Lauren. <laughs> Daniel and Lauren, I also want to thank you for answering God's call, even if it was different than you expected. <laughs> and I, I also want to say a thanks, just we partnered with NL Moore. Early on we said, you know, we really, we really want this to, to go as smoothly as possible. We partnered with NL Moore and Associates, a search firm really helped us out, resourced us, gave us many resources. I just want to thank, and Tim, actually, Tim West, his wife Cindy are here to join us, but Tim worked, he's actually the one that first had a conversation with Daniel, and Tim's here. Tim, Tim if you don't mind standing up, just so people know, know who you are, Tim West, but thanks, Tim. We had many a late night conversation, so it's good to see you, Tim. And also, I just want to, I want to thank the, the church staff. You know, that was, um, I know you, you, you really stepped up. You know, not having a, a lead pastor, you know, God's still led, but thank you all. Thank you, church staff. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I've said it so many times throughout this process, but, but I want to thank the church just for your encouragement. You know, as we as the search team are having all these conversations, um, you have all been encouraging. You've been praying for us. You've been telling us you've been praying for us and just been encouraging. We had good news. You know, you rejoiced with us when we had, you know, you know, let's wait a little bit longer. You were encouraging and said, that's great. You know, we'll continue to wait. Just thank you for being patient. So thank you. And last, I do want to thank the search team. That's why I brought, uh, asked you to come up. So thank you all. Um, I know it, just, it was a tremendous uh, opportunity for me to serve alongside you. And so I have a little, a little gift on behalf of the church for each of you. So I, I just want to say, as I, I hope I can twist this thing around and not break things, so I can look at there we go. Um, I know now my backside's to the church. My but you know, thank you, thank you for um, speaking up during meetings, for following God's lead. Thank you for sharing the wisdom that God has given you, and everyone bringing something unique to the table. Uh, I'm, I'm, I know, and I trust that God has just placed each one of you on, the, on this team for this purpose, and it was just an honor to serve with each of you. So, so here's a, a little something. So if you could, please thank the search team.
We're going to continue just with some prayer. If you could bow your heads. Father, God, we thank you and we praise you. God, we thank you that you are so sovereign, you're so big, God, that you, you can track the two sparrows and nothing happens outside of your will. God, in light of the uncertainty, at least the perceived uncertainty from our perspective of this past year not knowing, you know, Pastor Brent has been leading this church for 20 years and for him to, to step out, it's a lot of unknowns. But God, thank you, you are so faithful. And what a blessing it is to, to be here, beautiful weather, just worshiping together. God, I just pray that you continue to lead us. Pray for Daniel as he steps into this role. And I just pray, Lord, that you, you bless this church, that we can be seeking after you. And that we pray that you be glorified. We pray that we continue to listen to your, to your leading. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well, lots of human thanks and appreciation, which is very appropriate this morning. We're here, though, ultimately to honor our Lord and Savior. Would you stand and join us as we sing together about his faithfulness now? Christ is my firm. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. When everything around me shakes. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never.
great to see you this morning. You may be seated. Well, it is my pleasure and honor uh, to introduce to you all this morning our district superintendent of the EFCA. I don't know if you guys know him or not, uh, but he's uh, got to come to the stage now, Dr. Brent Burkhardt. Cornerstone family, it's been a while, right? But in fact, this morning I almost had to plug the church address into my GPS. <laughs> that eight minute drive, you know? But um, no, it really is so good to be back. Um, so good to see so many familiar faces. And it's really exciting to see a lot of new faces. And the fact that uh, there's a lot of people here that, that I don't know probably means you don't know me. So let me just kind of reintroduce myself if I can. Uh, my name is Brett Burkhart, and I'm so glad to have my wife and partner in ministry, Elby, with me here today, and also my daughter. Uh, my daughter, Chris, she just got hired at a hospital in the Woodlands, so we're glad that she's not going to be too far from us. And, uh, and then my wife also brought one of her coworkers, Lauren, from work. So, Lauren, welcome. Good to have you here on this special day that you can join with us here today. It, it really is good to see you here, Cornerstone family. And um, again, uh, my name is Brett Burkhart, and, and uh, 20... 22 years ago now, uh, my wife Elvi and I and a handful of families, some of whom are here today, um, we had a hand in starting this church, and we started meeting in the AMC First Colony Movie Theater in Sugarland. And uh, some of you remember that. In fact, the Hydors and the Montoyas showed up today. So great to see you guys here. They were with us back in the early days. And uh, the Lord then enabled us to purchase 22 acres of an old golf course. It's the property we're sitting on today. And we converted this thing into a church campus and added one service and then another and another one in Spanish. And down through the years, it's just been so gratifying to see people come to faith in Jesus, to grow in their walk with the Lord, to develop leaders and send them out into the harvest. And I am just so so humbled and honored that I get to be just a small part of the history of this church. It really is an honor and really is exciting. And it's exciting to be part of what we're doing here today. Um, I loved pastoring this church. I had no plans of doing anything else the rest of my life. But as you know, God has a way of, of messing with our plans, and he did that for me and for Elby. And we're glad that he did. He called me into a new ministry and a leadership role uh, in our denomination. This church is part of a denomination called the Evangelical Free Church of America, EFCA for short. And the Evangelical Free Church is broken down into 17 regional districts, and we're part of the Texas-Oklahoma district. And it's my privilege now to serve as the district superintendent of the EFCA Texas Oklahoma district, of which Cornerstone is one of the churches. And so um, I've been doing this for about a year now and thoroughly enjoying it. I, I uh, Instead of overseeing directly one congregation, now I sort of indirectly oversee about 75 congregations. And I'm still a pastor of sorts, but I'm really more of a pastor to the pastors. And I just love that. I love coming alongside these pastors, encouraging them, equipping them, coaching them, putting fresh wind in their sails. It's tough being a pastor, and I love just serving these pastors. Um, the, the role of the district is really to strengthen existing churches and to help start new churches. And so we've been very involved in church planting, and I love that. That's something I really have a heart for. And so, for instance, um, I've been coaching a church planter for a little over a year. And just a few weeks ago, March 26th, Elvie and I had the privilege of traveling to San Antonio, Texas, and celebrating the grand opening of Disciple Community Church, of the public launch of a new church. The next week, we got to do it again. We traveled up to Oklahoma City and celebrated the grand opening of another church, Gather Community Church, in that area. And we've got some more churches in the pipeline. So it's really been a rewarding, enriching experience to start and strengthen churches. Really have enjoyed it. It's been busy. It's been tiring. It's been a lot of travel. It's been a lot of learning. I'm still figuring out this job. But thank you to so many of you who kept in touch and reached out and said, hey, how are you doing? How can we be praying for you? That has really meant the world to us. We're so grateful for that. And it really is hard to believe that literally it was one year to this day that I preached my last sermon at, at Cornerstone Community Bible Church as pastor of this church. And uh, that wasn't quite how we planned it, right? My, my desire, our desire was that it would be a sort of a seamless transition between me and the next guy, that I would step down one week and the next guy would be in the pulpit the very next week. It's not quite how it worked out, right? <laughs> it took a little bit longer than that. And yet, in retrospect, in the providence of God, I really am confident that was, that was God's will. And it was healthy and it was good. That season of waiting, as difficult as it was, I think really allowed this church to sort of come out from under the shadow of the founding pastor, sort of form its own identity, prepare to, to, to step into a new leadership and a new season. And even in those intermediate months, 
um, I stayed in touch with Jeremy and the elders and, and many people here in this church and I watched you online. I was stalking you, okay? I was watching you from a distance and I was really excited with what I saw. I mean, it really was encouraging to me to say that, that even in the absence of a lead pastor, this church continued to move forward with unity. This church continued to advance the mission of Jesus in this area. And, and I just want to say that's just a testament to your health as a church. Well done, Cornerstone. And I think it's also a testament to, to the leaders of this church, the elders and the pastors. In fact, can I just again express our great appreciation to the leadership of this church? Well done, guys. Really, you led well in that transition. Um, Again, we've already done this, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't also just one more time acknowledge the search team. Great job, search team. Excellent. Um, Michael, when, when, when I saw the quality of people that we assembled on that search team, I knew we were going to come up with a good result, and, and we did. So well done, guys. I know it was a lot of work, a lot of late nights, a lot of conversation. You're probably tired. You're probably glad that's behind you, but well done. If, if I can just be honest with just the search team, and, and don't you all listen in right now. I just have one small concern about the candidate that you chose. Um, I'm a little concerned about his intellect. I'm a little concerned about his academic rigor and credentials. I mean, come on, PhD from Oxford, is that the best you could find? I'm, I'm kidding, of course. In all seriousness, in all sincerity, I want to say to the search team and the elders and the Cornerstone family and Daniel and Lauren, I could not be more delighted that God chose you to be pastor of Cornerstone. I really have been excited about that. And uh, having served this church for 21 years, LV and I can testify, you guys are in for a treat. You really are. This is gonna be a wonderful experience and I'm excited for you. And so it really is wonderful that, that uh, um, we get to be part of this. We're cheering for you, we're praying for you. I'm excited for you. So glad God has gifted you and put you here. And I'm so excited that I get to be part of this celebration today. I really am. I'm so excited that we get to be part of this installation service. And you may say, well, what is an installation service? I mean, Daniel's already been working here for a little while. What are we doing here? Well, um, an installation service is just a simple opportunity to pause and remember a few things. Um, this has been a crazy year for Cornerstone. Lots of candidates, lots of interviews. And then you find a candidate, and then he moves, and there's a transition. And it's just been a whirlwind of activity. In the midst of all of that, I think it's just healthy to pause and, and reflect on the significance of what's happened here. To pause and reflect on the significance of God's choice of a pastor for this church. And to really just reflect and pause and to thank Him for His goodness. To enable this church to, to, to navigate this season with unity and, and joy. And, and God's hand of faithfulness has been all over this church. It's an opportunity to say thank you. I think it's also an appropriate opportunity at this juncture, this transition in leadership, um, to sort of just reflect on, on what has God called us as a church to be, right? What is our role as a congregation, and what is your role as pastor to this church? And so that's sort of what an installation service does. Typically in a service like this, somebody gets up here and, and gives a charge to the congregation and a charge to the pastor, and I'm privileged to be the guy that does that today. And so we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 13 in just a moment. You can turn there, but right now let's go ahead and, and begin our time in prayer. Father, I just feel so good to be back in the Cornerstone family, and uh, I'm just so grateful as I look back on, on, on really 22 plus years of, of your faithfulness on this church. And that song says it so well. You, you haven't failed us in the past. You're not going to fail us now. Um, and through every season, through every change, through every trial, you have just, you just cared well for this church. And I'm so grateful for this church family that they've been just a, a wonderful uh, flock, a, a wonderful congregation, a wonderful church family. And I genuinely am excited for Daniel and Lauren as they step into this new role. And I'm grateful that they're here. I'm grateful that you've chosen them for this task. I pray, Lord, that they would really experience not only the warmth and the love of the congregation that we experienced for so many years, but they really would experience the smile of God on this ministry, that they would really sense your tangible presence as they leave this church. And so, Lord, we're grateful. Um, give us a good time in your word right now and a good celebration afterwards. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, one morning, just after 4 a.m., in the city of Huesca, Spain, local police started getting phone calls from concerned citizens. Um, in the middle of the night, these citizens had been awakened by the sound of bleeding sheep. They looked outside their windows and, and, and they saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sheep flooding the streets, trampling their yards, generally wreaking havoc throughout the city. 
And so two police cars were immediately sent to the scene. It took five officers 45 minutes to round up these sheep, get them back in their pen. And you say, well, how did that happen? Well, these sheep had a shepherd. And that shepherd's job had been to lead this flock of sheep around the city up into the Pyrenees Mountains for the summer. That was his job, but he'd fallen asleep on the job, right? And right under the snoring nose of this shepherd, 1,300 sheep silently escaped from their pen and decided to have a night out on the town, right? In fact, when the shepherd was found, he was still sleeping when the police found him. When that shepherd was supposed to be watching his sheep, instead he was counting sheep, I guess we could say, right? What you had there were some naughty sheep and a lazy shepherd. And that's a recipe for disaster. And that's not only true of Spanish flocks, it's also true of spiritual flocks. You know, quite often in Scripture, in Acts 20, 28, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, places like that, God metaphorically refers to the church as, as a flock of sheep. And he refers to the leaders of the church, pastors and elders, as shepherds. In fact, that's literally what the word pastor means. It's, it's a shepherd. And within the church, when you have naughty sheep and a lazy shepherd, invariably bad things happen. Trust me, with 75 churches in the past year, I've seen a little bit of that, right? But the flip side is this. When, when the sheep and their shepherd, when a congregation and, and, and the pastor, when they're working together in sync, right? When there's a relationship of mutual love and trust and respect, it's a beautiful thing to behold. And life-transforming, community-changing things can happen. I think we've seen something of that here at Cornerstone. And so it's essential that within the church, shepherds understand the responsibilities to their sheep, and sheep understand their responsibilities to their shepherd. So since this congregation now has a new shepherd, a new pastor, I think it's a good time to remind both you as the flock and you as their shepherd of the responsibilities that God has called you to embrace towards each other. And I think Hebrews 13 nicely summarizes both sets of responsibilities. In fact, let's look at it together. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Obey your leaders and submit to them, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. So let's look first of all at the responsibilities of a shepherd to their sheep, right? So Daniel, I'm talking to you, and y'all are welcome to listen in if you like, okay? Daniel, uh, the first thing that God has called you to do as a pastor, as a shepherd, is to feed your sheep. Verse 7 says, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you. The first and perhaps most important responsibility of a spiritual shepherd is, is to speak the word of God to your congregation. In other words, to, to feed your sheep, to nourish them on the truth of God's word. You know, properly understood, a pulpit is not just a, a fancy piece of platform furniture. In reality, it's little more than a feeding trough. It, it's just a place where you dish out to others what God has taught you in your own personal study of the scriptures, right? As a pastor, your job is not to be original. It's to unapologetically plagiarize God week after week, right? It's just to say what he says. It really is that simple. While it's simple, however, it's not easy, right? The task of feeding your sheep is, is hard work. It, it's not easy, and it is not a task that should be like, taken lightly. So let me offer you four encouragements as you go about this task of, of teaching God's word, this very important responsibility. Number one, be accurate. You know, as pastors, we must always resist the urge to go searching for a text of Scripture in support of our brilliant ideas, right? That's, that's not how it works. No, our ideas must spring from the text of Scripture. We don't go to the Bible seeking validation for our own preconceived beliefs. No, we, we come to God's Word as a blank slate, allowing Him to form our beliefs. We must never put words in God's mouth. We must always let Him speak for Himself. And so, be a careful interpreter of the Scriptures. Take the time to study each passage in its proper historical and theological and literary context so that you can rightly discern its meaning. Be accurate. Number two, be clear. One of my seminary professors, Howard Hendricks, famously said, where there's a mist in the pulpit, there will be a fog in the pew. Right? <laughs> and what he means by that is if as a preacher, you don't know what it is you're saying, you don't know what your main point, there's no chance this congregation will, right? 
And, and the reality is that in any given passage of Scripture, there are hundreds of things that you could say. But if you try to say everything, this congregation will remember nothing, right? Uh, remember, you're not writing a commentary, you're not teaching a lecture, you're preaching a sermon. Those are very different things. And, and, and the best sermons are clear, they're simple, and they're focused. Aim your sermons like a sniper rifle, not like a shotgun. Find the main point of the passage, then drive that point home throughout the sermon. Be clear. Thirdly, be practical. The Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Timothy 1.5 that the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. In other words, the goal of preaching is not simply information, it's transformation. It's not simply helping people know more things about God. It's helping them to love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and to love their neighbor as they love themselves, which, which means that your primary task is not simply to explain the text, it's to apply the text. It's to show people in very specific, practical terms what it looks like to love God and to love others in the context of the workplace, in the home, in their neighborhoods, and in this church. So in your preaching, be, be exegetical, be deep, be theological, yes, be all those things, but above all, be practical. Give people something they can use each and every week to help them be more like Jesus. Amen. Fourthly, be interesting. You know, there's some preachers who will tell you that the job of the preacher is simply to interpret and explain the text and that there's no place for storytelling or humor in, in sermons. And, and let me just say, there's a name for preachers like that. There's a word for them. Boring, okay? <laughs> um, these preachers will tell you that that, you know, telling stories merely appeals to people's fleshly desires to be entertained and to have their ears tickled. And when I hear that, I just have to wonder, have they never read any of the sermons of Jesus? Right? Because Mark 4, 33 and 34 says this, With many such parables he was speaking the word to them, so far as they were able to hear it. Listen, and he did not speak to them without a parable. Jesus rarely, if ever, spoke to a crowd without telling a handful of good stories. Now, Jesus didn't just tell stories to tickle people's ears. He didn't just tell stories to entertain them, and neither should we. But Jesus did use analogies and word pictures and simple, sometimes humorous stories to illustrate sometimes very profound and deep spiritual truths, and so must we. A good, carefully chosen illustration can be a powerful tool that can serve to convince and to clarify and to convict. And so... Everywhere we look in this world, if we have eyes to see it, there are illustrations around us that can highlight the beauty of God and the spiritual truths that are in His Word. So, so work hard to become the kind of skillful storyteller and illustrator of truth that Jesus was. Don't be boring. Be interesting. Okay? Now, that's not to say okay, that, that every meal that you feed this flock has to be a gourmet feast. Okay? That's, that's, don't put that kind of pressure on yourself. And Cornerstone, don't put that kind of pressure on Daniel. It's hard work coming up with a good sermon every Sunday. It really is, right? Uh, sometimes you hit a home run. More likely than not, you're lucky to hit a good single or a double most weeks. That's just the reality of it. And I'm mixing my metaphors here. Sorry. But, but again, don't expect a gourmet feast of Daniel. Don't expect that of yourself. But listen, every meal may not be a gourmet feast, but every sermon um, should be thoughtfully prepared and it should be spiritually nourishing. And above all, every sermon should winsomely introduce people to Jesus, the bread of life who alone can save us and sanctify us and satisfy our souls. <laughs> Nothing you do in ministry, Daniel, is more important than the responsibility of faithfully proclaiming God's word to this congregation. So guard your time in the study, make your preaching a priority, as a good shepherd, feed your sheep well. Amen. Secondly, not only feed your sheep, but read your sheep. Notice verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Now, as pastors, sometimes we like to focus on that obey your leaders part at the front end of that verse, right? But it's that last part of the verse that we should pay attention to, and it should sober us. Because it reminds us that we will be held accountable one day before God for the spiritual well-being of those whom he's entrusted to our care. And, and, and this is why, as this verse says, we must be diligent to watch over their souls. This is, this again, is shepherding language. A shepherd keeps careful watch over his flock. He knows when a sheep is missing and needs to be pursued. He knows when the sheep are tired and are in need of rest and encouragement. He knows when his sheep are anxious and in need of calming. He knows when his sheep are in danger and in need of protection. He knows when his sheep sort of need to get moving and need some clear direction. In other words, a good shepherd knows how to read his sheep. 
Proverbs 27, 23 says, Know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. As a pastor, as a spiritual shepherd, it's important that you not only be a good student of God's word, but be a diligent student of God's people, the people whom God has entrusted to your care. As important as it is to spend time in your study, you cannot spend all your time there, right? You have to get out and mingle with the sheep, eat with them, serve with them, laugh with them, grieve with them, love them, care for them. This is how you'll get to know your sheep. Now, this is not to say that as pastor, you have to attend every birthday party and do every hospital visit and personally meet every individual need within this congregation. No, in fact, if you try to do that, it's only a matter of time before you burn out and have a heart attack, right? Um, both Moses in Exodus chapter 18 and the apostles in Acts chapter 6 learned this lesson the hard way, right? They learned that in order to meet the needs of a growing congregation, they had to learn that they would have to delegate some of their shepherding responsibilities, and we have to do that as well. Um, Daniel, you cannot shepherd this congregation alone, nor should you try. You will need to train and develop others to carry that burden with you. Elders, pastors, staff, small group leaders, ministry team leaders, regular people in this congregation, you need to share that burden with Daniel, right? You must delegate much of that shepherding responsibility to others, but not all of it, right? Delegation is not the same as abdication. And no matter how large this church grows, no matter how your responsibilities may be added to, um, you must always still be personally involved in the lives of individual sheep, right? Um, that's important. Why? So that when you preach, you're not just preaching to hypothetical needs, you're preaching to real needs. You're not just preaching to imaginary people, you're, you're preaching to, to real people. You're not answering questions that nobody in this church is asking. Rather, you're able to speak directly and personally to the unique needs of this church because you know your sheep well. Jesus, the ultimate good shepherd, said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Commenting on, commenting on this dynamic, Barbara Brown Taylor writes the following. She says, In Palestine today, it is possible to witness a scene that Jesus almost certainly saw 2,000 years ago, that of Bedouin shepherds bringing their flocks home from the various pastures they have grazed during the day. Often those flocks will end up at the same watering hole around dusk so that they get all mixed up together eight or nine small flocks turning into a convention of thirsty sheep. Their shepherds do not worry about the mix-up, however. When it is time to go home, each one issues his or her own distinctive call, a special trill or whistle, or a particular tune on a particular reed pipe, and that shepherd's sheep withdraw from the cloud, crowd to follow their shepherd home. They know whom they belong to, they know their shepherd's voice, and it is the only one they will follow. You know, there really is something special and beautiful about the bond that forms over time between a shepherd and his sheep. And, and listen, Daniel, as having served this church for 21 years, right, I can tell you shepherding is hard work, but it's also very rewarding work. And, and you are in for a treat. As you spend time with these sheep, as you walk with them through both the mountains and the valleys of life, you will get to know them and you will grow to love them, even the ordinary ones. And... There's a few out there. We'll talk later. But, uh, no, seriously, this has been a huge blessing, and I'm excited that you and Lauren are going to get to experience what LV and I experienced. It really is a joy. And so, so feed your sheep. Read your sheep. And thirdly, lead your sheep. Twice in this short passage, pastors are referred to as leaders. Verse 7 says, remember those who led you. Verse 17 says, obey your leaders. But what kind of leadership is this talking about? When we think of leadership, oftentimes our minds naturally run to mission statements and strategic object objectives and, and job descriptions and goals and all those kinds of things. And certainly those are important aspects of leadership that you as a pastor will have to give attention to. But those are not the things that scriptures primarily emphasize when they talk about pastoral leadership. In the scriptures, um, it, biblically speaking, a pastor leads not primarily by his amazing vision casting abilities or his superb management skills. A pastor leads primarily by his example. Again, verse 7 says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. These verses encourage Christians to imitate the faith of their pastors. This is leadership by example. In fact, speaking to pastors and elders in 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3, listen to what the Apostle Peter said. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, listen, but proving to be examples 
to the flock. The power of a personal godly example simply cannot be overstated because the reality is there are some things that are better caught than taught. Um, Monterey is a beautiful little coastal town in Northern California and for many, many years it was a pelican's paradise. They had this booming flock of pelicans and part of the reason for that is because it's also a very busy fishing bay, right? And so as the fishermen would come in from the bay with their catch, they would stand at the docks, they'd clean the fish and then they would throw all the guts and the scales into the water and there would be the pelicans waiting with their mouths wide open for a free meal, right? And they just loved it. In fact, over time, those pelicans got so lazy and so fat and happy that they forgot how to fish. They forgot how to forage and find food for themselves. And that became a problem when um, things changed because there was a point when the fishermen got smart and they realized all these guts and the scales and all this extra stuff of the fish that were thrown away, there are industries that would actually pay for that stuff, like fertilizer and other things like that. So uh, at, at one point they said, hey, we're not gonna throw this stuff in the water, we're gonna keep this and sell it. And then all of a sudden we had all these pelicans with their mouth wide open waiting for a free meal and nothing's coming, right? The gravy train's gone and, and, and they didn't know what to do. They'd forgotten how to fish, they'd forgotten how to forage for their own food, and suddenly they're starting to starve. There's a famine in, in the, the pelican flock there, and, and slowly but surely that pelican flock began to dwindle as these birds began to die. Well, um, some conservationists got concerned about this, and so they, they came up with a brilliant plan. They traveled to the southern California coast, and they collected a group of birds from there, some pelicans who still remembered how to fish, still remembered how to be a normal pelican, and they transplanted them and dropped them right in the middle of Monterey Bay, right in the middle of all these starving, lazy pelicans. And, and what did those Southern Californian pelicans do? They did what pelicans do. They started fishing and foraging and finding food for themselves. And suddenly all these starving, hungry pelicans started looking around and go, oh, that's, that's how you do it, right? And they began doing it and the, the birds were saved, right? You know, um, sometimes people just need a good example. Those, those poor little pelicans just needed a good example to follow. And guess what? So do your sheep. Right? Pastor, you are a shepherd to this flock, but there's an interesting paradox that comes with being a pastor. At the same time that you're a shepherd, you're also a sheep. And, and, and that's a little weird, but at the same time it creates a wonderful opportunity because it gives you an opportunity to model for this flock what a healthy sheep looks like. To model for this flock what it, what it looks like to faithfully follow the good shepherd. And what this means, Daniel, is that you must not only carefully watch over your sheep, you must also carefully watch over your own life to ensure that it is a life worth following. In fact, when Paul spoke to the Ephesian elders and pastors in Acts 20, 28, this is precisely what he told them. Listen to what he said. He said, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Notice, he said, you need to keep watch over the flock, but notice what he said first, keep watch over yourselves, pastors, elders. You see, we need to make sure that our spiritual walk is vibrant and consistent and holy. And sadly, you know as well as I do that we've witnessed the, the fall of several high-profile Christian leaders and pastors. It's been a tragic thing to witness. And why did they fall? They fell because at some point while they were keeping watch over their ministries, they stopped keeping watch over their own souls. In their efforts to fulfill the Great Commission, they, they forgot the Great Commandment. They forgot that our first responsibility as spiritual leaders, ironically, is not to lead our ministries. It's to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind. Daniel, the spiritual health of this church will be directly related to your spiritual health as a Christian. You know, as pastors, we can't lead people where we haven't been. We can't impart what we don't possess. We can't pour from an empty vessel. We can't feed people from an empty cupboard. If we want to be meaningfully used by God in the lives of others, and we have to make sure that we're walking in the Spirit on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment with Him, cultivating an intimate walk with Jesus. Amen. Feed your sheep, read your sheep, lead your sheep. Well, those are the responsibilities of a shepherd to a sheep. But what are the responsibilities of sheep to their shepherd? Cornerstone family, this is where I talk to you. Daniel, you're welcome to listen in as well, right? And I think that the, the, the responsibilities of, of, a, of sheep to their shepherd, of a congregation to their pastor, really can be summarized in two simple words, submission and supplication, okay? Submission and supplication. Uh, first of all, let's look at that submission. Verse 17, once again, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. He says, obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them. Now, let's be honest, that language of submission, submit to your spiritual authorities, that makes some of us a little bit nervous. And why is that? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. Number one, because we're Americans, right? 
We are a nation that was born out of a spirit of revolution. We have our treasured declaration of independence, right? We're the Boston Seaport again. Don't tell us what to do. We are, we are Americans, right? That's complicated, secondly, by the fact that we're, we're Texans, okay? And, and, and that doubles our independence streak, right? Um, I remember I grew up in Wisconsin, and in Wisconsin they had littering campaigns that said nice things like this. Um, keep Wisconsin beautiful, right? And then we moved to Texas, and what is our littering campaign? Don't mess with Texas, right? You and I both know that's more than a littering ad. That's the, that's our slogan. That is the spirit of Texas, right? Come and take it, right? Remember the Alamo, right? And, and we were a sovereign nation once before. You mess with us, we'll secede. We're happy to do it. Just to, you know, that's the spirit of, of Texans, right? And so we have this independent streak. We don't like submission because we're Americans, we're Texans. Thirdly, we're humans, right? And there's something within just our fallen sinful nature that that doesn't like to be told what to do. We like to be our own master, our own lord, our own captain of our own fate. And, and, and let's be honest, some of that's just good old fashioned pride. And some of that just needs to be repented of. There is a healthy submission that God calls us to. Um, but let's be honest, to be fair, there might be another reason that some people get nervous when they hear this idea of submitting to spiritual authority. And, and tragically, it may be because some of you perhaps have come from churches where that authority has been abused. Maybe some of you have come from churches where, where, where the spiritual leaders really weren't a good role model, where they were guilty of, of bullying and manipulation and even immorality and unethical behavior, and it was just, you know, people to turn the blind eye to it because that's the pastor. You do what the pastor says. And, 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 and when you hear some of this language of obeying your spiritual authorities, everything within you says, run, right? And, and so before we talk about what it does mean to obey your spiritual leaders, maybe we should just briefly talk about what it doesn't mean, right? Uh, first of all, it doesn't mean blind obedience, okay? It doesn't mean you do whatever somebody tells you just because they have a title, no. In fact, I would say this, and I'm confident this will never happen here at Cornerstone, but if, if, if a pastor or an elder or any spiritual leader here were ever to tell you as a congregation to do something that's contrary to scripture, um, you not only have permission, you have an obligation to disobey that. You have an obligation to say to them what the apostle said in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than men. Okay, so when we talk about submitting to spiritual authority within the church, we're not talking about some sort of weird blind obedience. Secondly, we're not talking about unaccountable leadership, where, where spiritual leaders can get away with anything, no matter what they do, and that's how it runs in some churches, sadly. Read 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 says that if a credible charge is brought against a pastor and elder, a credible charge with multiple witnesses, um, as to their character, their behavior, you don't sweep that under the rug. You know what you do? You, you rebuke them publicly so that others may see it in fear. That's how seriously God takes the responsibility of congregations holding their pastors accountable, right? And so we're not talking about some sort of weird, unaccountable leadership. Thirdly, we're not talking about an environment where there's no dialogue or discussion. Again, earlier we read 1 Peter 5, which says that the heart of a pastor is not to lord his authority over the flock, but to be gentle and sensitive and to lead by example. What that means is that a wise pastor will lead strongly and decisively, but he's going to listen to his people. He's going to be sensitive to the needs of the congregation. And that doesn't mean that sometimes he or, or the elders may not need to make decisions that aren't popular. That's part of leadership. But it does mean that they'll do so in a way that, that takes into account the needs of the congregation and listens well. And so... Again, when we talk about submitting to the authority of your leaders and your pastors, we're not talking about blind obedience, we're not talking about some sort of unaccountable leadership, and we're not talking about an environment where there's no, deleg no, no discussion or, or dialogue, my way or the highway. No, that's not what we're talking about. That's unhealthy leadership. And if perhaps you've come from churches where that stuff's been true, if you've suffered at the hands of abuse of spiritual leaders, I just want to say, I'm so sorry. But I also want to offer you a caution. Be careful that you not allow your negative experiences with some spiritual leaders to cause you to reject all spiritual leaders. Because these verses tell us that, that, that the pastors and spiritual leaders are not only useful, they're necessary if we're going to be all that God wants us to be. Again, let me read the verse. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls. Notice that's not a suggestion. That's a command. It assumes that every healthy Christian will be part of a healthy flock of believers led by godly spiritual shepherds. And why do we need shepherds after all? Well, the simple answer is because we're sheep. And if you don't know much about sheep, I gotta tell you, that's not exactly a compliment, right? In fact, let me read you something that appeared in the Associated Press a few years ago, just to illustrate this point. This took place in Turkey. Let me read this to you. First, one sheep jumped to its death. Then stunned Turkish shepherds who had left the herd to graze while they had breakfast watched as nearly 1,500 others followed 
each leaping off the same cliff, Turkish media reported. In the end, 450 dead animals lay on top of one another in a billowy white pile. Those who jumped later were saved as the pile got higher and the fall more cushioned. <laughs> There's nothing we can do, they're all wasted, Nevit Bayan, a member of one of 26 families whose sheep were grazing together in the herd, was quoted by saying by Aksum. The estimated loss to the families in the town of Jeevas, located in Van Province in eastern Tur Turkey, tops $100,000. A significant amount of money in a country where the average GDP per head is around $2,700. Every family lost about an average of 20 sheep. Now, that's tragic. That's sad. And maybe it's just my weird sense of humor, but it's kind of funny, right? Like, it's sad that all these sheep died, but, but like the ones at the end, they survived because the dumb ones that went before them had this big billowy pile. I mean, it's just, it's bizarre, but this is the nature of sheep. This is, this is the creature that God compares us to as Christians, and if we're honest, right, there's a little bit to that, right? We, we lose our way, we're blind, we don't always make the best decisions, but, you know, sheep aren't very smart, but here's the problem. Sometimes they think they are. Sometimes they think that they don't really need a flock of sheep around them. They don't really need shepherds in their lives. Again, let me read to you a story. This one came out of the BBC. For centuries, shepherds have used various methods, from staff to dog, to keep sheep from straying from the safety of their care. In recent times, shepherds have turned to one another more sophisticated, have turned to more sophisticated methods. One method is a metal hoof-proof grid that is built into the ground around the sheep's territory, sort of like a cattle guard. The animals cannot walk over the grid, which is eight feet wide. This works well in keeping sheep in the protection of the pen. But early in 2006, shepherds in Yorkshire, England, found that they had a group of sheep to care for that were not only stubbornly prone to stray, but also very crafty. One of the sheep figured out a way to transgress the boundaries. It laid down and rolled over the grid. <laughs> the other sheep in the herd followed the example of the stray leader, and soon the sheep had spread over the countryside and found their way to neighborhood gardens where they ate food and the flowers of local residents. The shepherds eventually gathered up the troublesome sheep and returned them to their pen, but again they escaped and got into trouble, and again and again. While this special knowledge of escape of the entire herd of sheep may have seemed like an exciting adventure, it actually placed the animals into harm's way as several sheep wandered onto nearby roads and were killed, and many were attacked by predators. You know, what that illustrates is this. Shepherd who stray from their flock and from the watchful eye of their shepherd, they may think they're enjoying freedom, but in fact, they're placing themselves in mortal danger. And, and, and so too, Christians, when we stray from the flock and, and from godly shepherds, we are placing ourselves in spiritual jeopardy. Again, verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls, as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. God has placed godly shepherds in your life to watch over your souls, to care for you, to protect you in a healthy way. Not a weird way, but a really healthy way. And, and when it says, let them do this with joy, not with grief, that, that wouldn't be profitable for anyone. What he's saying here is, is be the kind of sheep that's easy to shepherd. Be the kind of congregation that, that makes it a joy for your pastor to lead you. Don't be a difficult sheep, right? Don't be the sheep that plays hard to get, that people always have to chase after you and try to find you somewhere, right? Don't be the sheep that's always hard to please, the one that's always complaining or criticizing, always calling up the pastor and go, Pastor, that's a bad idea. Don't, don't do that. Right? Don't, don't be that sheep. Don't be the sheep that's perpetually hard to get along with, the sheep that's always biting other sheep, right? Don't make your shepherd spend all his time wrangling ornery sheep. You know why? Because while he's busy doing that, something else isn't happening. What? The mission to which Jesus has called us. To make disciples. And, and while there's turmoil and ordinary sheep and the pastor's spending all his time trying to wrangle these difficult sheep um, inside here, guess what? There's still people out there that are lost and heading into a Christless eternity. And, and, and we dare not lose sight of that mission. Let your pastor lead you well. Come alongside him to fulfill that mission with you. you see, this is what it means to submit. It's not some weird idea. It really is just saying, Pastor, how can I step up and, and give and serve and come alongside you as you lead us in the process of fulfilling the mission to which Jesus called us? That's what godly submission looks like. It also means, as we were alluded to earlier, following your pastor, specifically imitating his faith. And I just want to pause here and say this. You know, church, um, I'm confident that the faith of, of Daniel and of Lauren is a faith worth imitating. Um, it's been said that God will not use a man greatly until he's broken him deeply. And I think there's some truth to that. There are some lessons that can only be learned in the furnace of suffering. 
There's some character traits that can only be developed in, in the face of trials and affliction. And, and I can't think of anything more heart-wrenching than the affliction of losing a child in death. And yet that's part of the Ostendorf story. And yet I'm just amazed that in the midst of that grief and that sorrow and that tragic experience, instead of running from Jesus, they ran to him. They clung to him in the midst of that grief, in the midst of that sorrow, and they came out on the other side of that trial scarred but sanctified, more like Jesus and more devoted than ever to serve him and to point people like you in his direction and serve his church. Listen, Cornerstone family, that's a faith worth imitating, right? And, and Daniel is not a perfect man. He will make mistakes. He will disappoint you. He's human. I, I disappointed you along the way. It's the nature of it. But I can tell you this, that kind of proven faith that clings to God in the midst of life's most deepest trials, that is a faith worth imitating. And so again, follow this pastor. Submission is not a weird idea. It's not some kind of blind obedience. It's just coming alongside your pastor saying, hey, we're for you. We want to encourage you. We want to support you. We want to, we want to follow you as you lead us on our mission to make disciples and reach this community for Jesus Christ. The first responsibility you have, Cornerstone family, to your new pastor is to submit to him, submission. Secondly, supplication. Notice verse 18. We don't know who the writer of Hebrews is, but presumably he had some relationship with the people to whom he was writing, some spiritual authority in their lives, and so he turns to them now as sort of his flock, and he says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. The writer of Hebrew unapologetically said to those that he served, hey, will you just pray for us? We, we want to live with a good conscience. We want to uh, conduct ourselves honorably in the way that we lead you and guide you. And I happen to know that's Daniel's heart as well. Daniel genuinely wants to conduct himself honorably. He wants to be the best possible pastor he can be for the glory of God in this church. And if you want that to be true of Daniel, if you want him to be that kind of pastor, the best thing you can do is to pray for him. Pray for him every single day. Listen, when you step up and become a pastor, you're putting yourself on the front lines of ministry. And in a sense, you're putting a big old target on your back. Satan will come after you. He's going to come after Daniel. He's going to come after his marriage. He's going to come after his family. He needs the protection that you can help him provide through the power and the strength of God in prayer. So, so pray for Daniel. Pray for his family. Pray for him in this season. And again, I, just speaking personally, in my time here at Cornerstone, the many years that I was privileged to serve here, there were seasons that were tough. There were seasons that were hard. There were seasons when I was dealing with stuff that I really couldn't share publicly, but I can't tell you how encouraging it was in those random moments to get an email or a text or a phone call or just somebody come alongside and say, Pastor, we're praying for you. That meant the world to me, and it will mean the world to Daniel, right? That's one of the greatest gifts you can do is to pray for your pastor. And so pray for him every day, right? Pray for him and for Lauren as they navigate this new season. Um, pray for him well. I love what Merrill Tenney said. He said, if a church wants a better pastor, it can get one by praying for the one it has, right? And that's true. And, and, and so I would encourage you, just as you are faithful to pray for me and for LV, uh, let me ask you to pray for them. And, and again, just as you showered on us the kind of love and respect and, 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 and kindness to our family, um, I want to thank you in advance because I know you're going to do the same thing for this family. I really am excited for you and Lauren. Um, it's going to be a wonderful season. It's a joy shepherding this amazing flock. I'm very excited for you. But Cornerstone family, pray for this family. Pray for this pastor. It's the best thing you can do. In fact, why don't we do that right now? If I could invite um, the elders, and if I could invite Daniel and Lauren, if you're available, if you could just come up here, we would like to just lay hands on you and, and just kind of officially pray a prayer of dedication over you. And so if the elders and Daniel and Lauren could come right now. Stone, if you would pray with us, please, over the Oscars. Wonderful and amazing Heavenly Father. Um, you have given us such a wonderful morning in which to, to praise you and just reflect upon your goodness. And 
honestly, if we spent the rest of the day here just doing the same thing, it would not be enough to express the, the feelings and, and the, the gratitude that I know we all feel for uh, the, the journey that you have placed us on and just your, your guidance and your goodness to us to, to lead us to this point. So, Lord, as, we, as we've reflected upon this goodness, we, we look forward to just what you have placed before us, that you have brought us to Austin. So Daniel and Lauren have followed, heard the call, and they have now been charged with uh, taking this role as, as the pastor of, of this church. And, Lord, we just pray that you would encourage them, that you would just strengthen them, and above all, that you would just guide them in their own walk and their own faith in Christ, so that through that, their lives would be that wonderful example that this church can follow, but that would also draw others unto Christ and the grace that God has provided through his sacrifice. So Lord, we just, we anticipate um, just the wonderful season of ministry that, that you are going to provide for us, that the growth that you have led us through in this past year is, is, is worth the, the, the time and, and the struggle that was required because of the, the great blessings that you were going to provide for us. So Lord, we just rest in that goodness and just anticipate this wonderful season that you are going to uh, show us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. It's also a privilege for me to pray for, for a pastor. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your mercy with us. Thank you for your word. Thank you because we come together as two congregations that seek after you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy in calling us. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would guide Daniel and the leadership of this church to shepherd us, Lord, towards you, to honor your name, to preach your word, to love each other, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you because we have seen you move through these congregations, Lord. Thank you for the testimony that it is. We know that we can only do this through your power, Lord. So we, we, we cling to that promise. We ask you, Lord, to empower us to carry your word forward, to love each other better, to bring you glory in all that we do. Y Padre, te damos gracias porque tú eres misericordioso para con nosotros. Bendícenos, Señor, unidos aquí. Gracias te damos por el llamado de este pastor. Ayúdanos, Señor, también a apoyar y amar y a orar por nuestro pastor. Pedimos, Señor, que tu bendición esté sobre nosotros, que tu espíritu se mueva de una manera grande, Señor. Ayúdanos a humillarnos ante ti, estar basados en tu palabra, Señor, y amarnos y orar los unos por los otros. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this has been an incredible journey. We praise you and give you glory. It's been a long time and you have been incredibly faithful. You have done things that are both wonderful, mysterious, and glorious. We thank you for seeing us through this incredible last year. Thank you for the search committee, but I wanna take the opportunity now to pray over Daniel and Lauren Thank you for bringing them here. Thank you for confirming the call for them to come here. Thank you for how you've worked in that whole situation. And thank you, it's been a joy to see your faithfulness and your greatness of your kindness and mercy. Lord, we didn't know what to think when Brent made his announcement. We didn't know what lay ahead, but all we could do was hold on to you. And I wanna praise you for the faithfulness of your people to hold on to you during this time. Yes, they said yes to walk in an adventure and to the incredible unknown. And you've seen us through that adventure. And now we begin a new one. I pray for Daniel and Warren that you would give them a heart for the work that you've called them to do and that your Holy Spirit would guide and lead them as shepherds. And that you would give us as members of the congregation grace, humility, and strength to follow. Lord, we give you the glory, honor, and praise in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, if you've gotten to know me and, and you know Brent, you know we both like to talk, so I'll keep this short. You know, our heart is, <laughs> thanks, Dad. You know, our heart is to feed you all. Uh, and the thought, Warren and I, as we talked, and I talked to the elders, the thought that might feed you the most was just sharing a bit of our story. You know, our, our call, as Brent shared, is that we follow the shepherd and that we then lead you as a shepherd. And you've heard Brent and Elvie that they follow the shepherd into this new season. Well, six months ago, if you had told Warren and I this is where God had us, we might have laughed. If nothing else, we would have thought there's no way. We weren't looking for this. Uh, my 20 years ago, about this time of the year, God put it on my heart to be a pastor. But then he asked me to wait. And I thought that might be a, a waiting until I was 50 or 60, that it was another season. And then over the last year, maybe somewhat like you, I've seen friends fall away from the faith and fall away from the church. And I've seen the church fail under poor leadership or a, a, a shepherd that had fallen asleep. And so my heart over the last year especially had just grown incredibly heavy for God's people. So in August, I talked to Lauren and said, hey, what do you think if we start a journey into seminary that might take us five or 10 years to then look at the pastorate 10 or 15 years down the road? So I applied to Dallas Theological for a preview day and probably not a week later, Tim West gives me a phone call and says, hey, there's a church looking for a pastor. What do you think? And Lauren and I looked at each other and they said, well, there's no way they'll say yes. So sure, let's have some conversations. Because <laughs> Lauren and I looked at ourselves, maybe much like you looked at me and said, oh wait, he doesn't have all the qualifications. He doesn't have what you need to be a pastor. And so we said, Lord, we're sheep and we want to faithfully follow you. We think this door will close early on in these conversations, but we want to faithfully follow. So we get through September and in October, the search committee, you know, in ways that we don't understand, felt like they wanted to invite us down to meet them. So in early October, we're headed down to Houston and Lauren and I have two prayers. My prayer is, okay, Lord, you've been preparing my heart for 20 years. This is earlier than I thought, but I wanna follow you, but I'm not dragging my wife into this. If this is what you have, you've made us one. You have this for both of us. Well, unbeknownst to me, Lauren's prayer was, Lord, this is not where I want to go, but I want to follow you. So, Lord, I have three very specific requests that I would like you to show up and show me that this is clearly yours. And I want to share those with you because one of the things we've learned is that wasn't just God's confirmation for us. That was God's gift to other people. Um, when we shared it with our friends back home or back in Longview, they said, oh, well, of course you have to go. So... I, I tease a little bit, but I want to share a little bit of the story with you. So Lauren's three requests. We lost a son, Ethan, four years ago, as you know. So Lord, I need to know that they will love Ethan, who they've never met, as much as we do. Second, Lord, I need you to give Daniel a dreamer. He wants to dream, so give him a dreamer. Third, I don't want to be the weird homeschool family, so take us to a church where there's other homeschool families. So we show up on the very first meeting with the search committee for a dinner, and we walk in the door, and Lauren says, okay, Lord, I really, really, really need to know this church will love Ethan, so you have three minutes. <laughs> you don't want us here? Wait four minutes, and I'll know this is a closed door. But if this is where you have us, I need to know within the first three minutes that this church will love us. So Lauren walks over to Michael Hanna, the search committee chair, and they do the, hey, how was your trip down from Dallas? How are you doing? And they were about to transition that part of the conversation where you start asking other questions. And Michael says, hold on a second. I'm sorry, I just need to say, I've watched Ethan's memorial two times and he was such a special kid and I'm so sorry. Lauren reaches down and she stops the stopwatch. Start stopwatch, she started on her watch. Yes, that's my wife. I love her courage. <laughs> When she went and looked at the, when she went to the bathroom later, she looked at her watch, 30 seconds into that conversation, God made it clear that you all were gonna love us and love our son, which was amazing. And as you know all too well, in January, you all flooded us with cards. January marked four years since we said goodbye this side of heaven to Ethan, and you all made it very clear that this was not something you were gonna forget or let us forget. Well, then we met Jeremy, and if you know Jeremy, Jeremy's a dreamer. 
So Lauren very quickly had a second answered prayer that there was someone who would dream with Daniel, God, what might you do through this church family? And then third, we met Anna. And within 30 seconds, Anna and Lauren are singing the same homeschool songs. And it's very clear that we won't be the only homeschool family here. So by the time we left in October, we were like, okay, Lord, wow. Well, we think this is what you have for us. We just want to be faithful to follow. And if the door closes, the door closes. And that's okay. Well, obviously the door never closed. And here we are. And I can't tell you what an honor, what a privilege, what an incredibly humbling thing it is to get to journey with you as we follow Christ. So my commitment to you is, I believe there's nothing like the word of God that will feed our souls and guide us in life. And I will feed you with that each and every week. I, I don't think there's anything in life that shows that other than doing life together and speaking to one another's life. So I, I wanna get to know you and I want us to know each other. And then lastly, I, just like Brent said, I cannot lead you into the word of God and to following Jesus if I'm not following him. So I am committed to following Christ wherever he leads. And for Brent and Elvie, it meant into a whole new season. For us, it meant into a whole new season. Church, I have no idea what Jesus has for us, but we're gonna follow him every step of the way. And I hope you'll follow me there, and we're gonna keep our eyes on him. Thank you all so, so much for inviting us to join me. All right, we're gonna invite the band up for one more song as we just worship and celebrate. And then when that's over, don't leave your seats. Jeremy has some really important instructions for us for food. So, will you guys join me? The band was here earlier this morning setting up and practicing. Would you join me just thanking them? Wow, what a great celebration. Would you stand and join us as we begin worship our Lord and Savior one last time together? Gift of grace. When gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer. There is no more Christmas and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is only bound to you. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. Oh, 
we've got some housekeeping to do now. We're going to turn uh, this area into our eating area. So here's what we're going to do. If you are in the first six rows over here, bottom up to this second pole, we're going to take those chairs and we're going to put them all the way in the back. So you guys over there, follow Dr. Vampus there. That goes to the back. If you are in an odd numbered row, one, three, five, seven, or nine, take the chair, please. Turn it around. We're going to put some tables in between. If you are a strapping uh, young man or older man or anyone else that wants to come join us, grab a table. We're going to put some tables down the middle. Thank you all so much. We're going to enjoy some food here together in just a moment. Amen.
early. I bought them early. <laughs>